when did you start to see this concept of entrepreneurship, you know, that has originally some ruthless capitalist connotations to it as complementary? Why, why did you think that was a good idea um, to, to adopt for change makers? There are social entrepreneurs that predate Mr. Carnegie, with all due respect. <laughs> so think of Florence Nightingale, Maria Montessori. Um, but do you think they saw themselves that way, necessarily? Well, they didn't use the language because yeah. we hadn't invented it, yeah. but that's what they were. Up to 1700, there were a few outliers, but there was no systematic. Then business did something really radical. It said, anybody with a new idea, if you implement it, we're going to make you rich and happy and respected, and oh, by the way, we're going to copy you. Um, Keyword: anybody. This was the end of the old order. This was the beginning of the everyone a change maker world. But for a variety of structural reasons, um, the citizen sector and government didn't participate. The citizen sector broke free of the pre-modern world around 1980, which is why we set up Ashoka in 1980. We could see that that ice dam was breaking. Uh, there's a variety of reasons for that, sir. For example, independence came to most of Asia around 1948. You add 30 years and you get to 1978. And so the first post-independence generation was coming of professional age. And we could see the first social entrepreneurs coming up. Um, so between 1980 and now, this amazing thing has happened. The citizen half of the world's operations has caught up with business in terms of productivity and scale and now globalization. We're not business. Uh, social entrepreneurs are in it for the good of all. We are not trying to capture a market and dig a moat. That isn't the point. So we are able to work together in ways that business can't. Um, so that, that's a huge power we have. Now, I'm talking as if there were walls. Well, there are historical walls. What has to happen is that all of us, including the citizen sector, have to become part of the universal open fluid team of teams that all the pieces come together as needed, what, whatever the opportunity is. So we're not going to be more like business or aren't. We're going to be something very different. And that's, that's the ultimate type of integration. But it's going to be around, I believe, um, everyone operating for the good of all because that's what is really required in this world. When everyone is powerful, you can't afford to have someone powerful swinging around there who isn't in it for the good of all. It's just it's way too destructive. And this is also what people want. We know that all the prophets told us, all the scientists keep telling us that it's when you express love and respect in action, when you're in it for the good of all, that's what makes you happy, healthy, long-lived, etc. So this all fits together totally coherently. Um, you know, entrepreneurship can be selfish, but social entrepreneurship, by definition, is entrepreneurship for the good of all. That's the distinction. I'm very glad you just defined it, <laughs> because you know I've I've taken a business class on social enterprise, and they started with a with a range of readings that defined that term in so many different ways. So I wonder, you know, since we have the opportunity to ask you what you think about um, different businesses who are very much for profit using that term to describe themselves and all the different ways that it's been defined and interpreted over the years? Well, social enterprise is not social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. you know, social enterprise has a fuzz of definition around it. It's very confusing. And I, I, I just illustrate the confusion. I like being able to go to the store and buy the same socks that I bought several years ago and know they will fit and they won't fall apart. I don't want to have to make socks. 
I think that's very useful. Now, why isn't that social enterprise? Um, I, I just, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of confusion here.